or they'll feed us. You ain't got no food, do you? Boy, I'm out of luck. I'm out of luck. We're glad to, to be here with you, um, and we're thankful for the inv invitation to, to be here with you, and it's always great to, to be able to come and be a part with Willette and uh, the great congregation of, of people that is here and being and good friends and family. And, uh, as y'all know, two of my children have married two of your children, or go, well, going to marry. We got one coming up. We had one in June, got one coming in March the 2nd. And uh, so, and uh, huh? no, we ain't got another one in December either. Uh, you still got to go to college. So we're, uh, uh, but anyway, I, I do have a third one. Uh, so um, y'all keep producing them out here. So um, can't go wrong. But anyway, you can't go wrong when your children marry people who love the Lord. And uh, I've always believed that. I've always taught that to my children. And to look for good Christian young men. First of all, Amanda and I always prayed that they would be who they need to be first. And living the Christian life. And, and then everything else would take uh, the way God needed it for it to. So we've been blessed. Of course, y'all know Drew. Uh, we're, we're happy to have him in our family. And blessed uh, to have him. And so we're so, so thankful for that. God has been good to us as, as parents. And uh, in helping us to raise our children, by no means are they perfect. Uh, by no means are we perfect parents. But uh, by the grace of God and the instruction of his word, we did the best we could. Uh, <laughs> so, again, we're thankful for this opportunity to be with you uh, tonight. Just a few moments ago, I finished up. I, many of you may not know, I'm, and I know I've got to get busy here because I don't have long, but... Um, I recently moved to Macon County, not living, but I'm working in Macon County now. Uh, I'm teaching in the school system here. Uh, I'm at Fairlane Elementary, and uh, I work and teach special, with special needs children, and uh, so thankful to be a part of that. And, and uh, I've already been able to, to make a lot of good friends, and uh, I've already been in multiple Bible discussions. Uh, there's a lot of denominations um, around that area. And uh, so I've been in some interesting Bible conversations already. They found out I was a preacher. And they'll come up to me and they'll say, we, we heard you as a preacher. I said, well, I try to be. Well, I want to ask you a question. Well, you don't say that to me for a preacher. Because when they ask you the question, we're going to give you an answer. And it's going to be a Bible answer. And... So we've had some interesting conversations already, and uh, so it's been a good, good, good thing. On the onset and the topic that has been given to me tonight and the text of 2 Thessalonians 2, and mainly verse 3, but we're going to have to look at verses 1 through 12 as well to be able to fully get a picture of what we are looking at, who or what, is the man of sin. Now, I really appreciate your elders uh, having this summer series and this particular theme because there are a lot of difficult texts that we don't know what it, what it is. We, we, and, and there, you know, I've, I've, as long as I've been in preaching and teaching, there are just some things in the Bible God didn't want us to know. He didn't feel like that we needed to know some of those things. And tonight, on the onset of this lesson, I can tell you there are many viewpoints and many thoughts about who or what is the man of sin. And I've looked at a lot of different uh, commentaries and uh, different thoughts and things from different people and, and tried to draw a conclusion and simplify it enough so that you and I can have a basic understanding of what this is going to be telling us tonight here in 2 Thessalonians 1 in verses uh, 1 through 12. And I want you to know there's, uh, and I want you to think about this. Have you ever noticed that when little is said on a particular topic, 
that it generates more discussion than when much is said. Now you think about that. When there's very little about something said in the Bible, it creates more discussion and more sometimes discord <laughs> that it shouldn't than any other topic or any other big topic or whatever because there's things left out that we don't know for sure or whatever. But of course, when, when little is said, the range of possibilities is wide open. And it sometimes generates strong opinions, not truths, but just opinions sometimes, which cannot be shaken because my opinion is what? Is worth just as much as your opinion on certain things. And to me, my opinion is worth more. And you probably feel the same way sometimes. So we could easily apply these statements to many things in the Bible, you know, that we just talked about, gossiping, and uh, do they apply? But what I, but I, what I want us to focus on, what I'd like for us to focus on is the speculations that are made in 2 Thessalonians 2, verses 1 through 12. So just who is the man of sin? Since he, or his, is of sin... It is fairly clear, I believe tonight, that we are talking about a wicked person. In verse 3, as you notice there in, in the text, he's called a man of perdition. Now, what some of us may say, well, what is, I've, I've heard that word, and, and what does that really mean? Well, perdition means ruin or loss or destruction or waste. Now, we see a reference of it in, in John chapter 17 and verse 12 according to Judas, if you remember, being referred to as that. Now, in our text also, in, in verse 4, if you move on down to, to verse 4 in our, in our text, we see that this man of sin is, he opposes God. Well, any time that we hear sin, we know sin is in opposition of God, don't we? But I want you to think about this when it comes to that man of perdition and what perdition means. Ruin, loss, destruction, or waste. Whatever conclusion we come to tonight, when you take and put the word sin in anything or any part of your life, you're going to experience ruin, you're going to experience destruction, and you're going to experience waste and loss. Now, I see these young people up here, and I always talk to young people, and there's young people scattered, and, and even older people as well. Anytime that we involve ourselves with sin, or whatever the case may be, we're going to experience those things. You're going to experience waste. You're going to waste part of your time, part of your life. You're going to ruin a good name. You're going to lose respect from friends and from others in the world and in your life and around you. And sometimes even destruction, you're going to experience those things. But going back to verse 4, it says he opposes God. Verse 8, if you go on down, he is without law. You ever thought about what our country would be like if we had no law? Now, we're in pretty good, bad shape right now, if you ask me. <laughs> but I'm going to tell you what, there's still good things, there's still good people in our country and around. But would you think about it, it would be chaos, wouldn't it? Well, what would our Christian life be like? What would our, our personal life? lives as we live here upon this earth be like without the law of Christ or the law, the, the word of God that we have. It would be chaos, wouldn't it? Well, that's what sin brings to our lives is a, a thing of chaos. So again, without law, acting in accord with Satan. Verse 9, you go on down, <coughs> excuse me, you go on down to, to verse 9. He says, even him who is coming is after the working of Satan with all power and signs and lying wonders. So he's in accord with Satan. Who or what is this man of sin? We keep, I keep referring to him with a pronoun, he. 
And I'm going to go ahead and in the very beginning and say that this man of sin is anything or any person that opposes the truth of God's word and God's way. Anything or any person that opposes in a sinful way from and what, what God would have us to do. Now, we can, by, by taking and, and, and reviewing or looking at what we just looked at, we can draw the conclusion tonight that he's not a nice man. He's not a person or a nice person. Now, the passage also mentions that he sits, if you go on and read through, uh, that he sits in the temple of God. In verse 4, when you go to the book of Ephesians in chapter 2, in verses 20 through 22, uh, we see other passages here about the temple of God being, <coughs> excuse me, the church. But when you go to the book of Ephesians in chapter 2 and go into verse 20, in reading through 22, you see, it says, and are, and are built upon the foundation of the apostles and the prophets, Jesus Christ himself being the chief cornerstone, in whom all the building fitly framed together groweth unto a holy temple in the Lord. Verse 22, in whom you also are built together for a habitation of God through the Spirit. So we know from our other teaching and through reading the Bible that we are the temple of God, and the temple of God and that dwells within ourselves make up the Lord's church. Now he says, you go, you get the, the, uh, go back to our first thing that we just mentioned there, that he mentioned that he sits as a God in the temple of, the, of God. The passages that tell us the temple of God is the church. Again, we make up the church. So are all Christians, according to 1 Corinthians 3 and verses 11 through 17, make up the church. So therefore, when a man or, or whoever involves himself and opposes God, he's actually what? Dwelling in a church. Why do we need church discipline? We all practice that here. Why? To rid the man of sin. Anyone who opposes or is contradictory of what God has, has put forth for us to do so what do we have to do? We have to take and keep the church pure, don't we? How do we do that? Through church discipline. We do that. And we have to keep those things out of the temple of God. And again, the temple of being our bodies. And our bodies make up the body of Christ. You know how all that works. But let me share with you just for a moment. One thought is the man of sin was the, and like I said, there's different different views and thoughts on this is the papacy in the, in the Roman uh, Catholic Church. That was one thought that I found. And not any one particular pope, but institution. But you know, the problem with that is that Catholicism is not the only apostasy which developed from the first century church. Now, you take the Gnostics. That was an apostasy, wasn't it? The Gnostics there who believe that all come from one or two gods or states, good or bad, that everything physical was sin and based upon their teachings or secret knowledge, that's where they get the Gnostic part from. But what about the, the Ebonites who accepted Jesus as the Messiah but denied, if you remember, that he was from God? Does that sound familiar today? There are many today who accept Jesus as the Messiah but deny his holiness, deny his, some even deny his virgin birth, some even deny his ways. Sounds familiar to our culture today, doesn't it? Many today fall into that category. Well, you go ahead and, and, and you talk about uh, the, the different things that people think that it could be. The, the Judaizers who wanted Christianity to be just a sect of Judaism. You know, the, uh, Acts 15 and verse 1 gives us a reference. They wanted it to be a branch off of the Old Testament. There in Acts 15 and verse 1, you remember, there were some who were teaching, teaching that circumcision was, a necessary, was necessary to be saved 
which was not the, the case, was it? That could be the apostasy. That could, uh, again, be noted as a man of sin. Then you have the Nicolaitans that you read about in the book of uh, Revelation 2, and verse 6, and 14 and 15 in that chapter as well, who encouraged God's people to follow sexual pleasures and idolatry, as did Balaam of old. Now, even in <clears throat> our world today, I think we probably have a lot of those folks as much sexually driven as our society is. You know, I could just go off and chase a lot of rabbits right here, just in a lot of different things. But for time's sake, I won't. There's a lot of secular history that goes with this, this particular topic. Arrhenius, who lived about 180 A.D., had this to say about this group. The Nicolaitans are the followers of that Nicholas, who was one of the seven first ordained to the, to the diocese, if I can say that right, by the apostles. The Nicolaitans lead lives or led lives of unrestrained indulgence. The character of these persons, he says, is very plainly pointed out in the Apocalypse of John. It shows that they teach that it is a matter of difference to practice adultery and to eat things sacrificed to idols. Clement of Alexander in secular history wrote this, who lived about 195 A.D., those who say that they follow Nicholas quote the, the adage of the man, the flesh must be abused which they pervert, but that worthy man Nicholas actually meant that it was necessary to curtail pleasures and lust. They took even what Nicholas said and turned it around to make something mean, to mean something that he didn't even mean for it to be. So these are your, all your different thoughts a lot of times of what, what people say that this could, could possibly be. Also, Tertullian, who wrote in 207 A.D., stated, I do not aim at destroying the happiness of sanctity as do certain Nicolaitans in their maintenance of lust and luxury. There were others who believed in continuing um, uh, other things that, that went above what the apostles had taught through biblical history. And you start talking about the Roman government or the Roman emperors or whatever, <clears throat> the papacy didn't even start until A.D. 606. And the current bishop of Rome accepted the title of Pope. But by this time, the branch that led, led no longer resembled the early church. And it was difficult to say who sat in the temple of God. They sat in an apostate church, but not in the church itself. You see, in verse 4 of our passage, keying off of that phrase that he called himself God in our passage tonight, another line of thought is that Paul was referring again to the Roman emperors. These men established themselves as the head of state religion. Many of them would take in the in city of Jerusalem and take and put statues in the temple of themselves, claiming themselves to be God. So most certainly, as Paul wrote this, you know these things had to be in his mind of what was happening and possibly what was going to happen as he wrote these thoughts concerning the man <coughs> of sin. Now, Going back into verse 3, it says, Let no man deceive you. This is what the King James, we've already read that. I'm going to skip that one. But I want you to notice what a couple different versions say here. Out of the New King James, it says and refers, As the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. The man of lawlessness is revealed, the son of destruction. We've, we've mentioned that. But also... In, in another uh, commentary that I looked at, it says, When wickedness will be revealed in human form, the man doomed to perdition, the representative of lawlessness is uncovered, the one is doomed to destruction. And I wanted to throw all of that in, in the middle of all of this, what I, I'm throwing a lot of stuff at you, and a lot of secular history. But I promise I got a point. <laughs> okay, I promise. 
there's a lot of stuff to think about here. There's a lot of different thoughts that people have had on this, and I think, it's under, I think we need to understand tonight before we leave here that no matter what as you read and what I read, none of it will affect our salvation. So let me throw that out there, okay, of who the man of sin or what the man of sin, sin is. But we can say that it can be the falling away and defined as desertion of the true religion, which is what? Christianity, the one true God. This would come first, and the man of sin would be revealed in the son of perdition. Um, so you, you go back to keying off the opposition to God. And I made that statement earlier, that any man of sin is anything that opposes God, and many see that then and even now as being the Antichrist. Now, you've heard of that word, the Antichrist. Because the passage talks about the man of sin's destruction at the return of Christ. A large body of beliefs, largely contradictorily but loosely similar, have arisen from this thought. And the thought is, is just before Christ returns, a man will arise representing all that Christ opposes. Christ then comes and destroys. Now, this is, this is some, some one person's thought and establishes an earthly kingdom that will last a thousand years. You've heard that before, hadn't you? Yeah. Some have the, the rise of the Antichrist at the end of the thousand year kingdom. And not only these people who claim these things and make these statements, they can't decide where they want the thousand years to be. They can't decide whether they want it to be at the beginning or the end. Because there are, due to my study and, and looking, they, there are those who want to do that. And it really just depends upon what flavor of premillennialism that you want to take, to be honest with you. But you know, the problem is with that is the Bible does not speak of a single Antichrist, does it? No. 1 John chapter 2 and verse 18. When you go and read that scripture, notice what it says, many Antichrists in the world already and more to come not talking about just one person so can we safely say tonight that that it could be multiple things multiple men and i'm going to tell you men have tried to make it hitler men have tried to make it the communist or soviet union men have tried to make it north korea men have tried to make it all of these rulers that here it is, here's the end of time. Now I'm going to tell you a short story <coughs> real quick. People, we are gullible. And some people are more gullible than others. I work with some folk. I work with some ladies. And I love doing this. It's probably mean of me, but I, I love doing it. I can go down and I can say, I can start one thing in one classroom and say one thing. And before I make it to the office and back, they're all in the hallway waiting on me. Did you say this was going to happen? I said, well, yeah, it's going to happen someday. Well, we thought it was going to happen today. Why did you make us to believe that? I said, I didn't tell you it was going to happen today. I just said it's going to happen. Now, I just make stuff up. Then I go back and clear it up. <laughs> so I ain't lying. Uh, but I just love doing them that way because they get all excited. And people are the same way about this whole thing of man of sin and this antichrist and the coming of Christ and one rising up that I'm going to tell you this story. There's a man, and I don't remember who told me. It was just real here recently, and I hope it wasn't one of y'all, but if it did, just be quiet and listen to it again. There's a fellow had bought a book about the second coming of Christ. I don't see nobody smiling. And... He and his buddy, they was all going to play golf. And he had figured out that, that in this book, that this certain particular day, now this is a true story happened in Cookville, Tennessee, on uh, Tennessee Tech's Golden Eagle Golf Course. They were reading this book, this guy was, and he was convinced on this very day that the Lord was coming back. Some man had predicted it. He said they, this group of guys that was, that was playing golf together said, they were uh, playing together, and, and uh, he wasn't even going to go play golf, and they finally talked him into it. 
because he was waiting on the Lord to come back that day. He said they got on a hole close on one side over there and said, uh, said the band at Cookville High School, which is just across the field, struck up playing their fight song or whatever they're playing. The horns blew and the drums beat. He said he fell to the ground and started rolling around and hollering. The boys, I told you the Lord's coming back. Because he had heard that band and he believed this book. People are that gullible. But you know, for people to take this passage and other passages about the Antichrist and about the coming of Christ and put a book to it and say that this is one particular person like the Roman government or like the Soviet Union or North Korea or whoever would be contradicting the Bible because if we knew that, we would know what? The time that the Lord was coming back. And we do not know, not even what? The angels in heaven know, do they? No. So now I'm going to tell y'all, folks, don't be so gullible when people start saying the Lord's coming back. Well, yeah, he's coming back, but when they start trying to put a day and a date on it, you just need to walk away. And you just need to tell them that there ain't nothing to it because you don't know when it's coming back. But I found with this passage, many people are try, try to do that. If you go on referring to many antichrists, 1 John chapter 2 and verse 22 is and states this, that anyone who denies Christ is an antichrist. Anyone who denies Christ, could we say, is a man of sin? Sure, we could do that. 1 John chapter 4 and verse 3, 2 John 7. Anyone who denies Christ came in the flesh is an, is an antichrist, and such are already in the world. Yes, antichrist is sometimes in the Bible used in a singular form. But since other verses tell us there are many, we know that it is a literal, literary choice, if you will. And again, the spirit of the antichrist is one who denies Christ even came from God and opposes God in Christ's ways. Taking the last thought there that leads to, I think, a very plausible explanation. The man of sin could personify many people's actions and lawlessness. According to David Lipscomb and Brother E.G. Sewell, suggested this many 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 years ago the man of sin is understood to be a principle of error or lawlessness that arose in the church the lawlessness principle is a principle among those claiming to be the Lord's people but are not willing to be controlled in all things by the word of God now other commentaries stated that the man of sin is an impersonation of the sinful principle spoken of the Apostle Paul in the emphatic manner. These quotes are not proof, but it rather illustrates, I believe, that the thought is not unique. And with this thought, the man of sin is the disrespect for the truth represented by a man who exerts the rule of the church, and the leading God's people into apostasy. And not only God's people, but the rest of the world. How many false teachers have we seen through the years? How many false teachers do we see now? They're on every corner. And unfortunately, they're in the Lord's church. We've got people teaching things in the Lord's church that I, I, I thought I would never see or hear. Now, I'm going to tell you, I'm going to get on a soapbox for a minute, but I'm going to tell you what we got. We got way too many of these people on these podcasts trying to rehash scripture that has been rehashed by good brethren for all of these years and don't need rehashing because the truth has already been put out and trying to put their own spin on it. We got way too many people who are on these podcasts and these young men who are not, does not have the wisdom, does not have the knowledge that a lot of our older brethren have and need to be learning from them rather than trying to teach us somebody else and be an heir of doing it. They're searching for likes and they're searching for how many followers they can get. 
Now, I'm going to tell you, I'm off my soapbox now. But I'm going to tell you, they oppose the truth. And we shouldn't have it <coughs> in the Lord's church. Such a man of sin is always present. It's seen in men who oppose Christ after the truth. Speak presumptuously. Go beyond what's been written. Bring in innovations and in ignoring the teachings of God. And not just a single person. I don't think we, can, we can't do that tonight. We can't put the man of sin to be one particular person or one particular thing. Did you hear that part where I said they go beyond what's written? They bring in innovations. You know, I was fortunate enough when I was these kids' age right here. <coughs> the eldership where I went to church put us through a teenage class. There was about 20 of us. And they put us through a class when we were 14, 15, 16, 17, 18 year old on how to recognize liberalism in the Lord's church. That has been more helpful to me, even still at age 54, than really anything. Because it taught me at a young age how to, to see when a man is going beyond what's written. It taught me how to see when they bring in new innovations. Because I'm going to tell you, when these liberalistic people come into the Lord's church, they don't come in blowing their trumpets and beating their drums. They come in as sheep, but they're ravaging their wolves underneath. And they come in and they start trying to make cosmetic changes. i seen one instance, I experienced it. I was in the church. I attended where this happened. This thing went away. And a nice, clear, glass crystal one was put up there. Wasn't well, nothing wrong with the one that we had. Now people say, what's wrong with a clear glass one? Ain't nothing wrong with a clear glass one. But it was the intention. They try to change things cosmetically, and then they start trying to change the truth. And we have to be on guard against those things. I've got many, many more notes on this, but I understand I only have about four minutes now. I could talk on and talk on about this subject. But I want us to understand, <clears throat> it talks about the falling away. There will be a falling away from the truth. 1 Timothy 4, verse uh, 1 and 2 talks about that. Our, our text tonight talks about that. And we talk about, you know, uh, a falling away. It could be the tradition of men replacing what Christ taught. Uh, and, and we have many warnings. Ephesians 2 and verse 2, Satan is at work. Uh, Ephesians uh, 5 and verse 6, empty teaching. And I want to tell you, I think like what we have in, a, in the pulpits of a lot of the Lord's church today is empty teaching. You have some teaching, but it's empty. There's no meat to it. There's, no, there, there, there's nothing to hold on to. There's nothing to take home with you. We want to make people feel good. Well, let me tell you something. Worship is not about you feeling good. You are the, God is the audience. You're not. And we have to guard against that as well. But again, going on towards the end, and I want to get this out. Why is this happening? Well, we can go back to 1 Chronicles 2 and ver 21, and verse 1, in David's sin and numbering the people, if you remember. It says, Satan moved David there. He provoked him. You can go on to 2 Samuel 24 and verse 1. Again, numbering the people. Why was it a sin in 1 Chronicles 21 and verse 1 and a problem? Well, because Satan was behind it, you go on into 2 Samuel 24 and verse 1, and they number their people again, and so well, there's a contradiction. I've had people say that. No, it's not. Satan was behind one in, in, in the Chronicles, and over here in 2 Samuel, God was behind it. You see, that's the difference. We don't need to be pushing things that God's not behind. Because when you got Satan pushing it, we can say we have a man of sin. God was behind it. It wasn't a contradiction. Satan is, un Satan is unable to do anything without God's permission. Y'all don't, rem don't remember Job chapter 1, verses 8 and 12? 
God limits Satan. He says, Satan, where you been? Going to and fro, looking. He says, you got a hedge around Job. I can't get to him. You see, God allows those things. Yet God will even make the use of wicked Satan to accomplish his end. Because Satan is behind it. 2 Thessalonians 2, where we're at tonight, 9 and 10. Go back to that man of sin. Who is behind that man of sin? Is it God? Satan is using every deception in his arsenal to keep, his, to keep people from being saved. And people are falling prey because they do not have a love of the truth. Why? Because God, 2 Thessalonians 2, 11, 12, God wants people to be saved. God's allowing it. What does 2 Peter 3 and verse 9 tell us? Tell that God's long-suffering to us for not willing that should any perish, but all should come to repentance. You see, we need to understand tonight, when we talk in relation to and compared to this man of sin, the opposition of God, there's a type of person that God wants. And tonight, as we have our invitation, I want to ask you, I'm going to go ahead and ask you now, and be thinking about it, are you the type of person that God wants? You see, God just don't want anybody. God wants a particular type of person. Thank you for your kind attention. I hope I hadn't confused you too much.